So I'm going to go to one GitHub. But you know, if you guys are offended with me using Stony Brook's information technology GitHub, I'll do it in one of my personal accounts. And he says, well, since you're asking about this, what do you mean personal accounts? So let's go here. And this is me. So these are the organizations I'm part of. So there is a kind of, this is, I, I would be ImageJS. This is a lab. Gene Kells is a, a sequence analysis organization. Well, it goes on and on and on. So as time goes on, you will be members of many GitHub organizations. So your GitHub ID is not owned by the institution. And you can associate email accounts to your GitHub ID anytime. You can remove them, add them, and so on. That's why I was confused when you asked, do we have to have a GitHub account on the Stony Brook uh, IT? You, you actually, you know, your GitHub ID is independent of the repository. So create one anyway, and then you can either make your repositories personal or... or so or not. except for the enterprise. The enterprise yes, the it's different. But we'll, we'll stay out of that for a second because I don't even know how to connect to the enterprise account from the outside. See? Why not they have an account? So we, can you just add them to their own I could. Okay. Can we do it now? Or? But why? Because if that's a problem, I'll do the Fibonacci example on another repository. Right. The point I want to make is that when you develop an app, you not having an account in the organization cannot be a reason not to develop it. But can you access yeah. to those functions that you were talking before about mm -hmm. the, uh, how to load and, and to add mm -hmm. applications to that yeah. store without being in the, yeah. the organization? There is a cap. So if you're, if you're willing to pay, the cap is removed. But if you're not willing to pay, GitHub will give you one private repository, and the others have to be public. And you can store data up to, I think, to 15 gigabytes. I don't remember the numbers exactly. To add it, to add it specifically, that's funny group uh -huh. store that we already yes. created. You have to be part of the MIT or no? Or you can do it only from your... No, I'll just go here and add you. Member privileges. OK, someone activated. Alina, it's you. Thank you. Uh, teams. So these are visible teams. There is a secret team. People. So I'll just go here, here and add you, and you become a member of Stony Brook Medicine Information. Just here, invite member. So we could do this now. It's just it's beside the point of the app. The app just has to be served to the public domain from anywhere. So from a GitHub account. Does that make sense? OK, so I'm going to use this one today. But if you guys are offended with me using Stony Brook IT, I move to a private repository. I have one with my own name, another one called Math by All. It doesn't matter. So let's stick with this one. But everybody understands the GitHub. Your GitHub IT is yours. You have to create an account. By default, you get a repository. You can develop apps in that repository. Stony Brook is, if your app is important, is going to be upset at you. He's going to say, no, this app is too important to be in your repository. It should be in ours. And if you say, well, I don't want to share it with Stony Brook, we just go to your repository and we click on a button that says fork. And you're forked. So for any repository, let's say apps. Apps are here. And Wade says, you know, I'm about to move to a well-paying company in Manhattan, and I want to steal the apps. Because he's a member of the organization, it just has to go somewhere here and click on fork. You see fork somewhere? There it is, fork. When he clicks here, my code is moved to uh, Wade's repository. So be aware of this. We are in the, this world of social coding is one where the code is extremely mobile. The code is no longer locked to machines, locked to repositories. Once you create it in one, it can be forked to another. It doesn't matter where you start. Unless you make the private repository. If you make, so let's say this one is private, so if Wade wants to steal it, my guess is that he also has a private repository in his new company in Lower Manhattan, you know, the one with the tall building and you know, we're trying to talk about <laughs> the helicopter pair. And, yeah. So you would create a private repository and you would fork it from one private to another. But maybe it's you and you, let's say you are an anarchist and you decide, no, this code should be property of the human species. So you could fork it to a public repository. But the thing to remember is that your code now is very mobile. That's the advantage of apps. The code is now separated from the data. There's nothing private about the code except your intellectual property. So if you're willing to relinquish that, you are in this new social coding model. Okay, so back here. So I'm going to create a new repository, and I'm going to call it 
Fibonacci. First problem I have is that I don't know how to spell Fibonacci. Is two B's or one? Two C's. One B, one N, two C's. Okay, so Fibonacci. Not, I'm trying also to get a picture of the man. Fibonacci, like this. Ah, fantastic, we have a picture. Okay, so we're gonna use the picture too. Fibonacci. Okay. So this little mark here just tells you that in the same organization, this is the first use of Fibonacci as a repository. I'm going to make it public, which means that as of now, that's why I was not responding to your question. This is a public repository. It can be anywhere. There are no restrictions for anyone anywhere to see it. If you're doing this for an app, you may want to keep it private. But, you know, I don't, there are a few reasons why private is a good starting point for a real app. One of them is that the first time you do it, there is a more than zero chance that you make a mistake and store some data you shouldn't, just by accident. You committed something to Git and you stored something, a password or something. So if it was private, you have some measure of protection. Still, if it's public, everybody can see. You can change that? Yes, you can go in and change to private. Yeah, later on you can also switch. Yeah, you can also change. You can change the code, all those things. So description, simple app to generate Fibonacci numbers. Yes, uh, although if you claim you are working in a university, which you can, I think they give you the same deal as as a paying one. And for people who do a lot of GitHub, there is also some life. Uh, GitHub account that they just send you an email and say, if you want a live GitHub account, you have such a good community because the code you're writing is being used by many people and they want you to continue. So it's kind of interesting. Okay, more differences. So I'm, I'm going to say I want to initialize you the readme. This is all being recorded. Create repository. So you could also play with this. I'm just going to ignore it for now. Wait a sec. Oh, it's created. So a web app is a web application. So we need to move to a different branch. So I'm going to go to the branch. So the branches are here. And I'm going to create the branch GH pages, which GitHub is going to interpret as one that is going to have MIME contents. So HTML will be treated like HTML, JavaScript, and so on. So the branch was not changed. It's there. But the default branch is still master. So if I go here, see, it still says master. So I go to settings and say, I actually have no use for the master branch and I'm gonna remove it. First, I make GH pages the default, so I update. Then I'm gonna give you a warning saying, look, a branch is a branch. You sure you want to change branches? And I say, yes. So it's changed. So if I now go to the default branch, you see it's GH pages. You don't have to, but I actually tend to completely remove the master branch. So I go here and I remove it. Go on. So every time I go here, there's only one branch and it's GH pages. Can you why the GH page? So GH pages, if you name a branch GH pages in GitHub, GitHub is gonna serve its content. To the web. So in addition to you having the code here, if you type, so I'm going to compose the URL where the content of the branch is served. So if this is the branch, what I have to do is I get the repository name, I put it in the beginning, then it's github.io, and then the, the project name, Fibonacci. So if I do this, I go straight to the contents of the GH pages. Of course, I'm not serving anything, so it doesn't show anything. Also, they will not list the contents. So if you, for instance, you should say, well, there's something there, there's readme. Why is readme not showing? Because, you know, they are serving the contents, but you have to know the name. If index is there, it will be served by default. If index is not there, you're not gonna get the list of contents. 
and you, you, you can see why, right? Otherwise, it's just overexposure of, of the code. Jonas, why don't you, why don't oh, you and if this was a private repository, the GH pages branch would be served. Remember this. So private repositories do not have protected GH pages. A GH page is a GH page, regardless of your deal for the rest for the other branches. Sorry. Once so, you open up the page, GitHub pages, it's it's open also to Google crawling it and other search engines. Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. Because you know, if you don't have a robots that text. Yes, it's a good point. I don't know. Huh? Well, yeah. That's how can you crawl it? Because you, you don't get the list. Okay, so but if it was indexed, it would be served. But then you have something called secret.html. They would have no way of discovering it. Yeah. So I don't see how crawlers could find anything but index HTML. Okay, so now we have a repository. I'm going to develop an app. So I need to clone it to my local machine. And I have a problem with my screens. Okay, there it is. So I go to source tree. You know, you, you can do it manually. You can use another um, version control system. I'm going to remote, and I'm looking for Fibonacci. And it's there. See? It tells me, oh, yeah, it's here in Jonas All Might. So it's, it's me, and I'm going to clone it then. So I like to clone these things in a folder called public open so I go here and repeat Fibonacci make sure I don't make a mistake now clone it okay so I have it there's an history and this was the initial commit, and there is only readme file that says this. So far, so good? Okay. So it, at this point, each person likes to develop in a different way. I like to start a web server and then use the development tools of the browser, but you know, some of you like WebStorm, others maybe like to use, um, what is it, um, Electron directly. So everybody can do this part any way they want. So I'm going to open my web server there it is so i'm going to stop it so you believe me pwd there it is my public folder you see the content they're all there so now i can start my http server on port 8000 and i'm there so the other thing i do because i know some things i won't be able to do in the it's the other side. I won't be able to do in the developer tools. There it is. I'm going to use Atom and open the same place. File, open Fibonacci. Okay. And first thing I'm going to do is create an index page. And Fibonacci groups, and I'm going to call it HTML. So you know that HTML is very lax. You don't even have to put the tags, and you, know, you should. But I'm just saying, you, you don't have to. If anyone is offended, I'll put the tags there. I'm serious. Anyone is offended? Yes? No? Joe is offended. No? I think Joe is offended. <laughs> okay. I did miscall it, you're right. HTML. Okay.
you already see mistakes, right? <laughs> so I don't make mistakes. <laughs> so of course this is not doing anything in the head, it should be in the body. All right. Okay, so now it's safe. So let's make sure it's all working. Oops, I don't know where this comes from. So let's go to the end. Local host, 8000. We'll match it somewhere here. It is. 87, Fibonacci rules. So now I go to source tree. So, so far I'm not doing anything most of you don't do all the time. I know this was a mistake, I need to remove it. So I'm just going to commit this one. Commit. I'm going to say Okay, so this guy is there. So now I can go back to the actual page. This one. And reload it. So we have an app. We'll put the code in a second to generate the numbers. But this is an app that works in all sorts of places. And if I put the right scripts in the head, it will be treated like a native app in your cell phone when you say add to screen. I just have to get a little manifest, explain how this should look like, and that's it. Now, we created this framework at Stony Brook to simplify your next step. So, so far, I think everybody knows this, right? Nothing special. I'll just create an HTML page and serve it. So now let's start adding some code. Can you define where is the one between the first page to be called, or it has to be the index of HTML? No, it can be anything else. Can you just give it a name. This is, I'm going to call this one Lala. Oh, you mean the one by default? Yes. No, the default page, as far as I know, it's always indexed HTML. But if you, you can serve as many pages as you want from the same place with different names. Sure, no, I think it'll take any index. Does it take index.js? You too? Okay. So anything with index. That's a good point. Okay, so I'm going to leave this alone. So now here in the, in the head, so I'm supposedly writing some code. So I'm going to say script source equals to um, feed.js. Okay, I'm getting lazy already. Script. Save. And at this point, the fun begins. So I can go to my local host, open the developer tools. Yes, we can move this somewhere else. Remove that extension. So this is just a cleanup. I had an extension going, I need to disable it because I don't want to use it. Okay, so back to normal. And it tells me FIB does not exist, so I have to create it. So now there are a number of options. I'm going to use the simplest one, which should be here to create a new file. Console.log FIB.js loaded. Save it as fib. Right, so now go back to the page. Reload. And now fib is loaded. Right? So now I can just start coding away. Uh, I'll put the, the Fibonacci number code we developed last time here. But in the meantime, let's now add this app to Stony Brook Medicine. Okay. This is the part you guys want to see, right? 
So if you go to the apps, you find out that there is a folder called app, and within this app, you have the strings that are read by clicking on specific icons. So this, these things have to be defined somehow. So for instance, if it's Esma, this is how Esma looks like. And this part is important. So we'll console.log loading Esma.js, just like we had loading feed.js. And then this is the first of the three commands. There's only three commands you need to be full citizens of the App Store of Stony Brook. You know, this is a lot simpler than Android, or and this is really, this is a scalable environment. Probably one that we want to describe in a paper and allow others to move to their institutions and use and allow ecosystems of apps to move between institutions, which is the whole point of many of these exercises. So this first command is called the insert app. Now I noticed that this command depends on a client side object, just like we saw for Tableau, for Plotly, for Firebase, for all these tools, is that in, in a modern lazy, if you want, app development environment, I give you an object and you can use the object. You don't have to worry about talking to me. You just have the object and you can use the methods of the object. So if I go back to the apps, there's some documentation. And right at the beginning, you get what you expected. You get a script that if you use it, this object is going to be made available to your code. So I go to my index.html, and I'm going to put it here. OK, so now let's go back localhost, and I'm going to reload it. The CSB apps is also loaded. So if I wanted to do SBM, insert SBM apps, insert app, it would be there. But I'm not going to do this here. I'm going to do this in a new manifest. This is the only point where you would actually talk to me or to Wade or to someone. I think only the two of us have access to this one, right? You don't? I don't know. Oh, I think you. Yeah. I, I, I made changes. Sorry? I have made changes. To so you have access here. So you come, you talk to one of us and you say, you know, we, we are, have this fantastic new project called Fibonacci and we need to create an app for it. So this is what we would do. We would go here, copy this. Sorry? Ah, but it's in GH pages. No, no, you, you just come to me and say, I need to create an app. Okay. And I'll ask you the following questions. Really, what is the name? And if he says, well, I'm still thinking about it. And I say, well, come back when you have an app, right? <laughs> but so, second one, what does this app do? You can be very, no, I don't quite know. That would be fine, actually, right? We don't quite know what this app does. Yeah. Now, the next one is more important, icon. What is the picture you want to see in the, and so we'll go through these questions for Fibonacci in a second. So I'm just copying the code. I'm going back here. And I'm going to create a new file. And I'm going to call it fib num, for instance, from Fibonacci number. Or maybe Fibonacci, why not? Fibonacci. It's such a long word. Dot JS. And I'm going to edit the file. Loading. So we don't need this actually, so I'm going to remove it. Unless you want to see it in your code. So the insert app, so there are three commands. One is a link to store. Remember, we've seen this a couple of times. Just creates an icon on top so you can go back to the store. The other one is render, which we'll use. So render is when it says, you know what, I don't even want to write HTML. Zero. I don't want to write an index HTML. I don't want any of that. I just want to write some JavaScript that, you know, Tammy would say, that does scatter plots. So render, link to store, and insert app. Insert app creates a private app. We won't cover polycaps today because a polycap is as on our side, just flipping a switch, and your private app becomes public. So by default, it's loaded. And if you're curious, this becomes the manifest. So insert app, name Fibonacci. Fibonacci is enough. Uh, generate Fibonacci numbers.
icon. Thanks to where was Fibonacci? Oh, there it is. Copy image address. Just make sure this looks pretty. So, so thanks to Daniel, we no longer need to worry too much about. Wow, is it funny by getting a data URL? You could use a data URL. That's fine, we're not going to use it. So data URL is a representation of a data type that is entirely encoded in the URL itself. That's impressive. So that's not, we won't use this one. That's too fancy. Let's go to the Wikipedia page. Sorry? That's very cool. Yeah. I just want a picture of the man. Anyone found a good picture of Fibonacci? Back to his name. I guess I should just click on images. Right? This one, Fibonacci image URL. This one should work. View image. Okay. So I'll go back here. Using it as an icon. On click. So here you have two options. Either you want to own your HTML page and you, you absolutely don't like Stony Brook, that's the case of many. She, she tried to like this for a while and then she decided she wants to, because she was playing with authorization, OS 2.0, she was playing the dance and she thought, for now, I want to own this problem. I don't want to have to do it through the app, which you can, it's not hard at all. And so she decided to secede from Stony Brook and develop her app outside. Or you could just use SBM apps render to let the app store render the HTML content for you. You know, this is a very powerful one because you just write in one line of code, just say SBM apps dot render and you put your DOM elements or your HTML and the Everything else is done for you. So I'm going to assume, just for, for now, that you want to go this route. So when I wrote the code insert app, you find out that I look for the suffix. And if the suffix is HTML, I push it out. If the suffix is JS, I just inject the, screen, the script. And you'll see this when you're writing your own code. So I'm going to leave it like this. I'm going to remove this out. And this attribute on click does exactly what it suggests. When I click on the icon, this thing is going to be run. So this thing has a difference. It's this one. So let's go back there. Where was that here? And there we are. So now we are ready to save. Create Fibonacci JS, commit new file. Voilà. So there is Fibonacci. It's here. Okay, so now let's go, let's commit all of this. So you believe me, it's working. So we created Fib where we are not doing anything, but we did create it. We created index.html. No, this is the wrong one. We edit this one. Let's make sure we like what we did. So we just added the SPMs. And here we don't have anything. Okay, commit. Keep me spelling it. Okay, it's there. So let's make sure it all looks good. So if I'm here, now in the public to, um, URL. Oh, by the way, remember you get HTTPS for free. You get SSL for free. See, you don't have to buy certificates or anything, which makes me think that I probably was careless. I was careless, so I just go here and add it. You do want to stay safe. Uh, 
and submit. Okay. Let's open. Make sure the thing is there. Yeah, they are both there. It's all good. Next step, it's done. You believe me? Private. V. Well, notice what's happening there. Once you get more than five characters, the tool is looking in our private GitHub GH pages exposed directory is looking for a word with that name. Talking about crawling. But you know, if you don't know the name, you, you can be typing for centuries and you'll never guess anything. <coughs> Fib or not. Did you make it private? No, GH, uh, yeah, it's all private. No, did you make the, uh, the app icon private? Is that broken image right there? No, it's not there because I haven't found it yet. No, the broken is Tammy's. Tammy is another person who likes to secede from the app store. And it, she succeeded completely. She actually destroyed the icon. <laughs> so I'm, I'm doing this. So, so you remember that there is a communication when you publish an app. That's you know we are going to trust you. Actually, there is no communication. We trust you to maintain your stuff, and that's why having a version control system where you serve it is so important. So the tool after five uh, letters is looking for a JavaScript file with that name that will do something and until it it just tries it see every time I type a, a character it tried you see here Fibonacci being written Fibon, Fibona, Fibonas, Fibonas and now it's gonna find it when I get to I it found it see the little guy is there now you know it didn't get an error anymore and if you click here generate Fibonacci series and it says oh where are the Fibonacci series We didn't write it yet, so now I can write it. So now I could go here and start rendering things. Uh, Localhost, so it's this one. So I'm going to do it with render. Good. I'm going to put some HTML so you see that this is HTML. It could also be DOM elements, it's all the same. So when I wrote the render code, again, it takes strings. If it is a string input argument, it assumes it's HTML. If it's a DOM object, it treats it as DOM objects and appends it to the uh, app space divider. So I'm going to save it. First time we do it, remember we have to save as. We are not in Asma, we are in public. Fibonacci and Fib is there. In place. Let's change the color. Style equals color blue. So good. Yeah. So save it again. See, from now on, it's just saved there. So if I do it here. It is. Okay, so now I go back to my version control systems. There it is. So I made a change in feed. Can look at it to make sure. Rendering. Voila. Commit. And it's done. So if you now go back to the app itself. So if I reload, the private apps are going to be kept in local storage. Remember we talked about this last time. I should probably put, oh, that's Tammy. See, it's complaining here about Tammy. So what this means is that when we all have an app, all of us, it doesn't matter how silly it is, I can help you. Because if I see an error message, I, you know, I can be nosy and go see your code. And vice versa, any of your colleagues from a cell phone can start checking it. And this creates uh, something that didn't exist otherwise. 
which is we can check each other's code, learn from each other, and I can say, oh, Dale, why exactly are you using this? I can ask you because I know it's there. Even if the code is private, because anyone who doesn't have the secret keyword would not be able to see your code. So I would argue, and I'm, I know I said this many times already, that there is no reason for each of us to have at least one app, at least one, where we can explore what others are doing and we can give something back. And again, you can can be any topic. And going back to the GitHub conversation earlier, it can be in any repository you want. It can be a private repository. Maybe you like manga and you're doing some manga drawings, and it doesn't matter as long as we can link them from here. The only thing that happens on the Stony Brook side is that we insert your manifest in the list of interpretable keys. That's it. You see why I was avoiding the no, you don't need to have an account in the apps uh, GitHub. You just have to have a GitHub account somewhere. Actually, you don't even have to have a GitHub account. You could serve your content straight to the world, but it's easier to do it in GitHub. Also, if you do it in GitHub, others can steal it in the good sense, so they can borrow from you. They can do pull requests. They can find things you should improve. You have you can create tickets. So there's a whole social environment around GitHub that it would benefit your application. And now I'm getting an error saying expected token in index, and now we start the process of debugging the code. So it's saying here, you know what, maybe you shouldn't have done it HTML because I don't, this is not HTML and it looks like HTML, blah, blah, blah. So I go back to the code and I say, okay, this is not working for us for some funny reason. So I'm going to go straight back to Fibonacci JS. Oh no, it's Fib, Fib.js, right? Fib.js. All right. I want to be absolutely sure that the code is there. You can always do these checks. See, being served also low, FGS loaded. It's not there. See, something happened. What happened? Where is the render? Ah, there is the render. See what happened? When you're developing, the, especially for those of you who like the browser's development environment, remember that the, the browser has a cache and the browser will try to be as lazy as we are. So if the browser cached a certain file, it will use it and then update it. So if, by refreshing the page, I updated the cache of the browser for this file. So this is <laughs> explained largely why many apps work like these ones. They will work offline. It's not because it's just the cache of the browser that keeps a memory of the files. So let's go back here. So let's click on this guy again. And we still have a problem. Index, so see, it's, it's not refreshed. Give it a couple of tries. Well, that's the other thing is I, I didn't find Still not there. On there. I have to clear that. Ah, that's right. You're right. Local storage here, absolutely right here. Let us do a. Sorry, you're right, Joe. All right, Fibonacci. So it's a secret app. Now we have it. You know it's working. See? Voila Fibonacci. Voila Fibonacci. It's going to be there forever. I'm not using in the, uh, the HTML page anymore. Did you notice that? Should I remove it so you believe me? Should I just kill it, call it something else? I see many suspicious faces. OK, I'm going to destroy it. I just want to give an example that if you're writing an app in the middle of a meeting that says, I need an app, we are talking about one file. I mean, it's really, really simple. Just you go to one file, you fill a string, you put some HTML, or you assemble it with JavaScript. And you know, often, by the end of the meeting, it says, sure, here's your stupid app. Because it's really, it's just going to one file, you alter the content, and it's served. So if I go to the same page, this is how quick it is. So I'm doing here. 
and says, no, I don't like blue, I want red. There you go, save. And let's keep my phone. I'm gonna reload it, make sure it was, yeah, it's saved. So see, how many clicks? One click, let's do the second click. Color red, second click. Go back to the app. Just so you see it on the phone as well. It's a private app. It's there. Red. The same thing here. If you load it. But, uh, of course, if you do this, you go back to the source. I'm going to click here. Yeah, red. Right. Are you convinced? No? But now that you render once everything that you do there, it will be rendered on that page. You don't really need to, to render any line that you create. Yep. That's it. Oh, I see what you're getting. If I'm debugging the tool, can I debug it in a way that the tool is always displayed to me and I don't have to go through this little loop? Yes. No, let's say that yeah. also. So if I can say add another label there, mm -hmm. will it with the render method? Or? No, you, you could write your code completely on your own. I'm just saying, so, and for instance, both Maggie and, and Tammy, they have reasons to want to exit completely the store, and they do. It, the user has no idea that they just move from one domain to the other. You know, nothing changes in the header, everything is the same. So you could say, no, I want my work environment. I don't want any of this. The purpose of the render is just to make your life really, really, you, I can't even imagine a scenario, let's say Maggie. Maggie maybe, no, she really likes her work things. But she's in a meeting and she wants to do her science. You know, she's doing a master's, maybe she wants to do a PhD, I don't know. And she's thinking, okay, I want to get out of what I have to do for this meeting as soon as possible. The fastest way for her to have a work done before the meeting is over would be to use render because she goes there, she changes this, changes that, that's it. So let's do something a little bit more complicated because this is where I would go with, with the code. So I'm here, right? And I know that anything I change is updated automatically. So I say I'm going to create a new thing here. I'm going to say button and close. And here, do something. So save, I refresh, it's there. And at this point, and I thought that's what you meant. So he says, you know, I don't see any of this here. I, will, I need a real-time development environment. So what I'll do is that I'll go here. So the code is feed.js. I go to my app. So you remember this maybe from past times we talked about it, that if you put a word here like Fibonacci, so we refresh it, the tool will look for this as a JavaScript file, and if it doesn't find it, see, it generates, it did find it, so it's there. See? It just creates automatically this thing. So instead of putting this that doesn't do anything, I'm going to put localhost. Have to refresh. And what am I getting? Mixed content. Oh, that's right. When you do this, you have to do HTTP. Just a detail. All right. There you go. See? So now I can be debugging. So this is during a meeting. You're just Debugging straight from the source. So let me do it again. Where do I have the local host? There it is. Fibonacci. Fib. It's there. So now I can move here. Oops. 
remember because you're in a new page the first time remember to save it in the place you're serving it from right place it's all good you just have to replace and I could say oh yeah I'd like red to be green so save reload okay it's instantaneous and you could even say okay but this is the point where uh, maybe I don't want any of these I want this to be a variable or let's pollute don't do this actually I can't make myself do it sorry <laughs> to pollute the so I'll create something like this or you could even go to SPM apps SPM so app is a place that is empty for you to use any way you want so maybe I would go here and say okay let's do this equals to a function so this is the way I code I'm not suggesting you should do it this way and now inside I will do my rendering and so let's say var h equals to you know put the string Render app replace. Replaces. It completely clears the division, the app space, and puts it there. So now I, I will put the rest. So render h. And you say, well, why go through that sort of convolution? Because we are creating this within a function, and now we can write regular JavaScript that does graphics and does other things. What's wrong? Oh, render h. Anything else? Looks good. So, say, well, no difference. Except my screen. Let's go back to red. So, I believe it's working. But once I have this in H, you know, once it's there, I could, for instance, give it an ID. Button ID equals to Lala Fib. So, save it, load it. And what you know now is that LalaFib exists. LalaFib, yeah, it does exist. You see I'm getting? And I can say, okay, so after I render it, or maybe I want to put all of this in, within an H3, I want to write some code here that when you click on the button, you do something, as you could render here. I could also define a callback. I could call React. At this point, it's all React. You know, you could say I'm done with JavaScript. Render is the last JavaScript command I want to see. So the, the world is now completely open. So what I'll do between, I know we reached the end, we have like four minutes and you may have questions. What I'll do between today and next Wednesday is I'm just going to put the little silly code we did last time. It, it, literally, it's going to take me 15 minutes because I already wrote the code. It's just, just put it there. The button is going to have a little box that says how many numbers you want and you put 30 or 300, it doesn't matter. And the numbers are going to be generated. So what render does, what insert do, and what uh, store link do, these are just three commands that are there to help you. You don't have to use them. So you know this one, spmfs link to store. Just create another one. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yes. Is, is there a way for you to put some code in there to see if it already exists? Yeah. Because what I've done is I wrote my own code mm -hmm. to only run this if it yeah. doesn't already exist. So <laughs> this is exactly why GitHub changes the way we work. Because you develop, you're saying, well, I could solve the problem, like Joe says, but why am I going to solve the problem if Dell is going to have the same problem and then you're going to have the same problem? You can just tell me, you know, you solve the problem. Another one way that's mentioned several times and I've been ignoring for no good reason. Why don't you create a ratings? Uh, system that people can say the apps they like and the apps they don't like, and we get some feedback. That can be hard. Yeah, <laughs> it could hurt your, uh, <laughs> your pride. I have, a, I have an ego that's yes. pretty large. I don't want to get damaged. But so this is the point where we are all working together. You can tell, yeah, I don't want to check for this, you check it, and so on. Uh, what else? Oh, and uh, I'm missing one. So you see, render link store. What was the other one? Oh, insert. 
insert app is to create a private app, which we use in the manifest. But this insert app, the reason why I kept forgetting to tell you last time is that you actually never have to use it. You just have to tell me. This is my manifest. This is my name. This is my description. This is my icon. And this is my JavaScript or my HTML page if you want to succeed from the, the thing. And that's it. So then you can use React, you can use Angular, you can use anything you want. Just remember, the choice of framework is a religious choice. So you're free to choose anything you want. But then you cannot come tell me that my religion is not acceptable to yours. Okay. Make sense? Questions? We have two minutes. One minute. Just one single question. So mm -hmm. if I have an existing uh, like, uh, uh, web app, Mm -hmm. Like C base, so I just need to use the uh, link store. I don't need to create that uh, in that. Uh, That's the right. Store. Yeah. So if you, you go show, to C base. Show us the C base. Uh, I, I saw. Sure. So C base is here. Yeah. So this one. Where is C base? So I'm going to here. So C base is in Stony Brook, is it? Stony Brook. Yeah, no, this is IT. Oh, down. Yeah. yeah. You see, I get the images. This is called, you guys want it? I don't know what's, what's up upstairs. I don't know what this is. Is this something that CBIS uses for some reason? No? We no? use it. No, I used it earlier. That's all I was playing around. Okay, I'm just going to reload it then. And so if you go to the insert CBIS, it's probably the one you want to see. So I'm going back here. C base. So we're not we're not talking to have you about this one. This was a few days ago, so the tool was not as polished. I actually did it. You know, we, we were talking and I was taking notes. So C base says insert app, and then what is the name? C base description create on database icon. This is that straight from where you are. And see this one, the last one. This is the important one. C base connect JS. So Javier at the time, is, and I suppose he still likes the model, he said that he, would, he wouldn't, doesn't want to be bothered with the whole CBase stack until the connection is active. We, this is exactly what these systems are about. So if there is a meeting, which there was one, where they say, uh, we need an app that does this, 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 this. The, what is the most important thing? It's a UI, there is a connector, so we can work slowly. And so the original task was just to create a connect. So let's go find this thing. So this is in IT, if I go back here. So this is have his own repository. And you can see that he has permissions to change it somewhere. Oh, this is a new one. Someone did this one, we can find out who did it. See by ZC. so it's a private app. And this is the CBase Connect. See, connect, log, ta -ra -ra -ra. create page. I didn't even have render at the time, isn't that funny? How many private repositories do we have? Basically, I think it's a finite number, but I don't know how many. Don't you say? No. No, no, just users. Users. No, no. in the cloud it's. The number that is kept, right? Yeah, Okay. I don't know many actually. We should know. But at some point we run out of private. Yes. I think many of the apps you develop in private repositories, you then make them public at the end. As long as we're not storing connection streams. <laughs> The API token. I guess it has to be known. I don't see that we should be. Maybe in the internal GitHub we can lose the rules, but putting tokens, even on a private repository, it's all kind of bad. Because you still serve. Yes. You still see it. Even if you don't see it, you know what they, someone else can. What they said to you. Well, in. In Azure, you can have uh, environment variables. Mm -hmm. which we put that. So we bought it. Yeah. Some people said it created a separate service. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's another option. They would have a service for all of our apps. So, 
this is the last conversation and then we have it because we have past time. So what's the question is the question we had before. How do we deal with security? So we are connecting to a backend. Okay. So we are connecting to some sort of backend that needs security. Where is security handled? It's not in the JavaScript manifest. <laughs> So you, you can handle it, if it's a very professional service, you would handle it in the node service. So the node service would play the OWASP 2.0 dance that maybe just went through. So it, people click on a link, and all of these, these libraries are all available, you don't have to spend much time on it. People click on a link, it goes to your authenticator, generates a token, the token is made available to your app, but it's never, never, never stored anywhere. You know, it's just there, it's just sitting in your app. And then when you're done, you close the session, everything is going away. Next time, log in again. If you're already logged in in Google, there's an example of Facebook, and that's your authenticator. The, when you open the page to go outside, Google automatically detects you're already logged in, and they cut the dance in the middle, and so you're logged in automatically. You don't even see anything. The user just sees the name pop up. All right. So everybody, please start an app. You just have to give me four things, a name, a description, um, so for those who don't have one, a name, a description, an icon, and give me links, you know, don't send me icons, just say give me the link, and uh, JavaScript or HTML page, four things. Thank you. Let's have a look at the app now, so I'm done with the coding. There it is, so we have a seed. A link of the string. Automatically, I'll use the last two elements to reseed, so it could go on like this. It could, of course, go back to the beginning or to any other number for that matter. And you could also change the number of points. For instance, um, say it's 100. And there it is. Let's have a look at the code. We're calling Fibonacci from the Fibonacci repository. And this guy is in the Stony Brook Medicine IT um, GitHub account. Remember, this could be in any repository. It doesn't even have to be in GitHub, any place that exposes the JavaScript code, which means that the app, really, it's about these few lines of code. So we were here. Last time I stopped recording, and I just added some code to change the color of the boxes, the length and the seed. I pasted the little Fibonacci generated we wrote last week, and I wrote code to start the generator every time you click on the generate button, which was called feed button. That's it. So this is how simple an app can be. Of course, this app doesn't talk to any backend, but that wouldn't make it much more complicated. It would just be about an asynchronous call to a web service. All right, I look forward to seeing your apps now. Bye.